I'd give you some water, but you don't like water either. I'll take anything at this stage. <laughs> they suggest you, maybe you should paddle a bit down the Amazon, and you're like, well, I'll paddle it all. It's a fine line between brave and stupid, and I often fall in the stupid camp. There's another animal that you said you wouldn't eat. I thought they were just showing me their guinea pigs. I didn't realise I was picking my lunch. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Spooning with me, Mark Wogan. Each week, our guest gets given two spoons. One with something they think they love and one with something they think they hate. Our dishes are created here at the Mount Street Restaurant by Jamie Shears, the head chef. Now, on to this week's guest. Is there anything this woman can't do? She can dance, she can kayak, she can hire wire. Is there any stopping Helen Skelton? Helen, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. To spooning. When you said that, I thought, like, actually, I'm really bad at ironing. I'm really bad at making the bed. I'm very good at ironing. Okay. Yeah, I don't really like to make the bed. It's the duvet thing, isn't it? Putting a duvet. They, they should it's be... the inside out thing. You've got, you've got to do the Nazarene. I'll, All show, right. I'll, I'll show you later. All right. Now, you're here, apart from to eat some lovely things, right. maybe some stuff you think you don't like. Okay. But we're also here to talk about your book. Oh, thank you. All right. Which is oh. In My Stride. Yes. All right. Now, I've read this. All right. I did go to the trouble of reading it. Thank you. And I've learned a little bit about you. But I've got this idea, right? So you know the app, What uh -huh. Three Words? Do you know that one? Uh, no. Okay. So it's this fantastic app where uh -huh. you put three, people give you three words. Yeah. You put it into the app and it shows you exactly where they live. Right. Right. So having read the book, we're going to do our own version of what three words, where okay. I'm going to give you a selection of words, and it's about you guiding us to who you are. All right. I wrote these down somewhere. Hold on a second. Where have I put them? There we go. Okay. There we go. So we're looking to be guided to who the real Helen Skelton is. It's terribly disconcerting seeing my face there on the so table. I can move you away. Yeah, I'm like, Would you like oh, me to move you away? No. There we go. We're going to put you down here okay. for a minute. Okay. So I'm going to give you a selection of words. You've got to choose what three words, because that is what is going to guide us to the real Helen Skelton. Okay. All right. Gritty, chaotic, mother, lunatic, loving, <laughs> kind, tenacious. Choose three of those or add one of your own. I'll take all of those. I'm happy with that. Okay. Yeah. So you think that sums you up? Because yeah. what I found extraordinary is the kind of almost laissez-faire way in which you describe some of the things you've done. I mean, when I read about the, the one that got me because I suffer from vertigo was the high wire one. As you're describing that, I actually felt sick oh. at the idea of, of that. However, I was slightly relieved by when I, when I got to the picture section of the book, you were on a cable. Yeah. I mean, if you fell off, you weren't going to plummet to the ground. I, the, you'd left that bit out. So I'm not saying you cheated, but you were... You... Some did. <laughs> the thing about the, that cable was, obviously I did that high wire for BBC, and so I had to have the cable on for health and safety. But before I went on, the lovely rigging guy, who was just a wonderful man, and he said, do you know what, Helen? If you fall off the wire, you're probably not going to die. But if you fall off the wire... <laughs> With that cable, it could crush your ribs, and by the time we get you off, you might have stopped breathing. And I was like, "What?" <laughs> okay. So like so, the safety thing. You see, you left that bit out. <laughs> well, because also I didn't really want to. I'm not really a fay, as you can probably tell, mm. with health and safety. So I was like, I didn't really want to question the health and safety thing. So you know, you grew up in Cumbria mm -hmm. on a farm in what seemed like an idyllic childhood. What then encouraged you to go out in the world and risk your life, having sort of been brought up in this sort of bucolic way? And going, I'm going to leave here now and go and endanger myself on a regular basis. I think, because people always say to me, oh, your pa parents really adventurous. My mum's scared of getting in a lift. Like, she's terrified. Where she, do you get it from? She can't watch Crystal Maze because she gets too scared. Um, so it's definitely not something I inherited, but I think what I probably did inherit is that... My mum and dad always did stuff. You know, when we were kids, if we got on a skateboard, my mum would get on a skateboard. My dad would join in. And I grew up in that kind of famous five way. And I just had freedom and space and trust. I used to play hide and seek with my brother. And I, he never realised why I always won. I always won. Mm -hmm. Because I used to get on the barn roof. And I think, do you know what? I left off that list. Yeah. Competitive. Yes, true. Highly. Competitive. Yes. 
And I, so I used to get on the barn roof, which was very high and very dangerous. And one day my dad caught me up there. And rather than tell me off, he just took me to a builder who gave me a lecture about how unsafe that was and how it might collapse. There's some real thought in the parenting there. Yeah, because he was yeah. like, there's no point in me. Well, it's like, it's like with my own son. Whenever I start to give him advice, I open up with what I'm about to tell you is sound advice, but I understand it is the wrong face and the wrong voice. Good, valid. You know, because he'll, otherwise it's like... Well, my kids climb everything, and I think there's no point in me saying don't climb. And then the other day, I told them to stop fighting, and Ernie went, you boxed. And I thought, yeah, you valid. See, that's something we, we share. Oh. I boxed for a while. I boxed for about five years, and I loved it. But my, but my nose goes that way, but it doesn't go that way. Oh. Because I, I got it broken and fixed within 30 seconds. So the guy who punched me was a professional boxer. Okay. And it put my nose across my face and he went, and I was like, oh, oh. oh I'm sort of reeling around the ring. He goes, oh, he goes, hold on a second, he takes his glove off and just goes like that and pulls it straight. I think he, did, he didn't do a bad yeah. job. Yeah, people pay a fortune for that nose. But, but straight. yeah, no. So can't breathe through my right nostril though. Oh, I mean, of all the things. Look, look. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love good boxing. Good to know. Yeah, good, good to, to know. know. Yeah. Good to know. Good to Always know. keep it left. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I, but I love boxing. And you discovered that you loved boxing. And as we both discovered, if you do it properly, it's the fittest you'll ever be. I couldn't. It was the fittest I will ever be. You were so... You were only in there for three minutes. Mm. Three minutes, three times. But you're just pouring sweat. And it's terrifying. But in a brilliant way. But that's the thing. And I mean, you have gone to great lengths to terrify yourself at various points. But what I loved about it is, which might sound slightly perverse, is you never feel more alive than when under attack. No, and I think, for me, I think everybody gets a buzz off different things. And I get and a buzz tried off them all. the challenges and the kind of being pushed and the thinking you can't do it. And I think sometimes people go, oh, I don't do that because I'm terrified. And I'm like, but that's what's good about it. Mm. And... You know, I, for me, all of these things are good training for life. You know, life throws things that you don't yes, deal with. Yes, I mean, with. you don't necessarily have to kayak down the Amazon to train for life. I mean, there are other ways of doing it. But you say that. But the whole thing about the Amazon was you never knew what was going to happen. You no. never knew where you were going to start and finish the day. You so never do you knew. like to be in a sort of constant sort of level of fear and adrenaline? Is that your sort of default? Not constant. But I just think it's a good way to feel alive. Like everybody gets their kicks differently, don't they? And I just think you get one life. And I was in this phenomenal position where I did a lot of these things when I was a Blue Peter presenter. And I just think you make the most of every opportunity. And I was on a show at the time that was fighting for relevance, that had a big history, a big heritage, a big name. And how the Amazon came about was there was lots of discussion. And someone said, why don't you do a bit of it? And I why don't you do it all. But that's you. They sort of suggest to you, and I read about it in the book, they suggest to you, maybe you should paddle a bit down the Amazon. And you're like, well, I'll paddle it all. And I think it's a fine line between brave and stupid. Yes. And I often fall in the stupid camp. Well, you know, that's a good person's fault. But the other thing that I, that I loved about the book was, you know, you sort of describe these extraordinary adventures and then equally engaging is the kind of simple home life that you seem to equally enjoy as well. And this brings me to my first little hidden thing here, which oh. is your love of oh, I'm all right about cereal this. in yes. a mug, and also your love of a big mug. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, nothing makes me... I, I am so Tell happy about this. Tell them what it says on the mug. I like big mugs and I cannot lie. <laughs> You are the mother. Yeah, my kids also love that song. Um, I love cereal. And, you know, when I was running, I used to go out and run for 8, 9, 10, 11 hours. And I had a friend called Kieran who used to do the last bit of the run with me. And he'd walk into my flat and go, oh, my God, I'm ravenous. What can we eat? And I only ever had cereal. And he used to get so mad. Because he's like, how are you running for nine hours a day and I'm yeah, nothing but cereal? that was the other thing that I picked up from the book. You're not a cook, are no. you? Who was the cook in at home? Uh, well, I had to cook for the kids. No, no, no. When you were growing up. All oh, right. Uh, um, my mum. She yeah. was that. And a good cook. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> Sorry, Mum, you're being outed now. She's a wonderful woman. <laughs> I wouldn't. Which makes up for the terrible food. Yeah, I wouldn't. No, she. I wouldn't say that she's like. You know, how people love cooking. I wouldn't say that she loves cooking. <laughs> but you see, I, I I come from, and I've said this before on, on on this show. I come from the position of no passion for food. No passion. Oh, uh, no. But she, you love your food. Oh, I love and. I, I mean, I feel like I'm being harsh on her there, but I just don't think she... Mine was a kind of traditional, wholesome farm, big meals, big Sunday dinners. But that sounds lovely. What's wrong with yeah, that? Yeah, no, I just wouldn't say she was ever, you know... She didn't fall into cordon bleu. No. No, but that's fine. Yeah. You know. So I didn't. you didn't specify what your favourite cereal, or will you just eat any oh. cereal in a mug? Oh, any cereal in a mug, because you can walk around with it, you see? And you're not, I mean, <laughs> but do you ever sit still? No. No. I know. I, people often say to me, what's you time? I'm like, mm. I wish I did. I do need to sit still a bit more. But I don't know. I just, there's always something to do. There's always something to make the most of. I'm a, yeah, I'm a bit chaotic, like I said. Every day. Yeah. Every day to the full. Right. So we, you can take that home with you. Oh, I'm that's really your, happy that's, about this. That's your new big mug. <laughs> And we'll get those out of the way because I want to get to something else here. Because obviously, before you, I mean, you, that's a sensational snack, right there. What? Just the sh just shreddies, just straight from the box. Oh yeah, that. Tr listen, I mean, this isn't an endorsement, but you name it: trains, yeah. planes, automobiles. Yeah. Fine. Helen Skelton, the face of shreddies. Less exciting. What's that? And yeah, no, I'm not. No, too, it requires too much moisture. The shredded 100%, wheat. hundred percent. Yeah, you've got to let you it know. soak in. Yeah. But once it soaks in. Then it's sort of porridge, so why not have porridge? Yeah, good for you, but I don't, you know. You know. I mean, other than it's wheat notes, but you know. So we've covered your love of cereal in uh -huh. a mug. That is for you to take home with you. So happy about that. Because um, I know you, you also talk about loving to just walk around with a coffee that it, it appears to like it could last you all morning. Oh, I mean, I. So that actually holds a pint, that. Does it? Yes. I mean, I probably have like three or four coffees that size in the morning. Good, I like that. So here, you talked about things that you love and you hate and all that sort of thing. I'm sliding this across the table to you now. Okay. And uh, one of your least favourite memories was one of those. Oh. Talk to me about that. Is I mean, the aroma that has come off <laughs> as I've taken the cloche off is quite something. Because you were fed this by somebody's grandmother. Tell us about that. So my best friend, Amy, um, her nan used to give us salmon paste sandwiches before, after school, before brownies. And her nan was... She didn't like you? <laughs> we used to watch Pingu and eat these. <laughs> <laughs> and now, every time I see Pingu, and I'm, which is a remarkable cartoon, isn't it? Yes, yeah. um, And it just takes me back. And I, we didn't... But we, we didn't want to be rude because... It was her nan. You know, if it were our yeah. mums, we'd probably have gone, nah. But it was her it. nan, and she used to be so proud of these sandwiches that she made us. So we used to go into the living room. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's a few salmon sandwiches ended up in plant pots and things. Would you be prepared to eat some now? Come on. In for a penny, on. in for a pound. Oh, oh my <laughs> God. Feeling it back. Wowzer. Just have it. <laughs> it's like cat food, isn't it? Oh, yeah, in I go. <laughs> oh my God, that, the smell. That... <laughs> the smell, why is it that that smell immediately brings to my brain the curtains, the couch, Pingu, and, and, and do you know what? I can... But nice memories tinged with awful ones. But do you know what? Isn't it funny how the brain works? Because that's not, that's not an enjoyable sandwich for me. However... <laughs> <laughs> my brain has gone to a happy place because I can picture her nan, her immaculate hair, her big earrings, the way she moved, the way, oh, our Helen. Like, even now, oh, our Helen. And she used to wipe her face with the dishcloth. Dishes, <laughs> Hygiene face. is everything. Yeah. Hygiene is everything. COVID wasn't a thing. I mean, that really makes me feel good. Isn't that weird? No, no. Well, that's, that's part of it, what it is. It's, it's about bringing you on a little journey. So we'll go to the next bit. So... Like you say, it's interesting how... I'm just going to pop that down there. It's interesting how food can ignite mm. various senses, thoughts, memories, that kind of thing. But part of this is oh, we gosh. remove one of your senses. Mm -hmm. 
So it's time to put the blindfold on. Oh my God, wow, that sounds so sinister. <laughs> Good blindfold though. It is a great blindfold. Is it your first? <laughs> <laughs> so here I have a little something for you. And okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed the spoon to you. Okay. Okay. And you need to describe the flavors and the textures and what you're experiencing. So here it comes, open wide, bit wider, bit wider, bit wider. There we go. There we go. So tell me what you're experiencing, tasting, what you can feel. It's cold, yes. it's lumpy. Cold and lumpy. That's not really what we were going for. Something custardy. Custardy. Cinnamon. Mm. Is it like a Christmas pudding? Has it got like, it's definitely got some sort of fruit in it because it tastes sweet. It's not bad. Um, I feel like it's a sort of Christmas pudding with custard. Right, well, take your blindfold off because what that was, was something made with what you said was one of your favorite ingredients. So that was a carrot cake ice cream. Oh. Because you said you love carrots. Yeah. Now explain to me, because this is one of the things that I found extraordinary is like, so one of your many adventures is you decided to cycle a bicycle to the South Pole, which, you know, I often think of doing. And your, your, one of your favorite food memories was when you came, you, you came back and you had an apple. Uh -huh. Now, I can't think, you know, of anything I'd want less having sort of traversed a very cold area. Like, give me an apple. I'm no, dying for an apple. You say that, but you basically, so we went to the bottom of the world. We've lived, um, so you have to take everything onto the ice because there's no shops, funny enough. And so we had everything put into ration bags and because you know, it's minus 40 or whatever, 70 miles an hour wind, you're not going to be opening a packet of a packet of biscuits, etc. So you have these little sandwich bags and you ration everything. But it's everything. It's so weird because as a woman of my generation in my job, it's the opposite of being diet conscious. Mm. It, conscious. In those environments, you are looking for foods that are small but highly calorific. I can't speak now, I've got a carrot cake on my mouth. Mm. You're looking for foods that are highly calorific. So it was um, dates, it was dried fruit, it was biltong, it was all those sorts of things. And you've got to be consuming in excess of what, 3,000 calories thousands a day? Thousands and thousands, yeah. Yeah, because you're burning it like crazy. Well, you say that. Especially if you're on a bicycle cycling to the South Pole. <laughs> so we'd have all these bags, you know, 30, 40 days worth of bags of your food for the day. And the only food you got was at the end of the day when you rehydrated a meal. So and that was a real palaver. Mm. Melt the ice, have hot water, add the hot water. And if I'm not mistaken, it played havoc with your stomach. Oh, food. Awful, awful. And, you know, you're in how many, it was because it was the layers that you had to be in for that. So you had, what, four layers of thermals, a sort of duvet trouser, then the sort of Arctic suit over the top. Let's cut to the chase, and you don't want diarrhea in that environment. No, exactly. If you're going, able to go through the eye of a needle, Fine. Did you, did you have to just, you know, your first layer of uh, thermals, did endless pairs of those just get discarded on the ice as you well, went no, along? That's the other thing. You can't even, I mean... I've, you can't I'm, leave anything behind, can I, you? Literally. Thank you for putting that so politely because I didn't want to say it in this wonderful environment. But you cannot leave, because it's so cold, there are no bugs. So if you did a wild wee or a wild number two, mm. it's gone. If you do that on the ice, it's staying there for decades because mm. there's nothing to break it down. Mm. So you take everything with you. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, if you if you imagine you sort of do that, gross. and then you for, fast forward sort of you know half a million years. Exactly. And there's there's some scientists going. I believe we found an early skeleton, <laughs> <laughs> and it ends up in in that yeah. version of the Natural History Museum. There you go. Yeah, yeah. But and and I think that's why you know to be serious, that's why people think you shouldn't do these kind of trips. You know, it's like mm. it was it was a good time to do it because it's harder to justify now, but. In that environment, you, you, everything you eat is rehydrated. Everything you eat is loads of chemicals in a little tinfoil bag or a sandwich bag. So when you get off the ice, all you want is something fresh and real. Yeah, but an apple. Gin and tonic and an apple. Oh, gin and you left out the gin and tonic bit. What would you have? I mean, you think about... I'd want steak and chips or, you know, I'd want a full meal of some sort. But just like, just an apple for you me. You just want something fresh. 
Well, yeah. Fresh but, and clean. Or just freshly cooked, something that I hadn't been able to get my hands on. I mean, surely you could have snuck an apple at mine, you might have frozen. Well, they, but they had, um, but it's just not, it's not enough calories in an apple. You can't justify it in the sledge. No, that's true. And, and it's heavy, I suppose. Yeah. You and you, there was, so when you. Pound of apples. No, I'm not dragging that all the way to the exact, North Exactly. There you go. Mm. See, you're already changing your mindset there, aren't you? I am. I'm, 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 coming round, I'm coming round to the apple. But it was apples and carrots you said were, were one of your loves. Mm -hmm. And w what is it with carrots? I've always loved carrots. I don't know, everything about them. Little buttons, round, sliced, even tinned. I'd not, go... not roasted with a bit of maple syrup? Oh, yeah. That, that's actually one of the only things that I can cook, roast vegetables, because it's easy, isn't it? But, but, I mean, who doesn't like a roast vegetable? Who doesn't love a roasted carrot? Okay. Well, look, we, we've got we've got our next spoon, so okay. on, back on with the blindfold. But I always thought that eating a lot of carrots would give me good eyesight, but my eyesight is actually terrible. Well, you don't require your eyesight for this next bit, so okay. you're fine. Okay. Off off with the cloche. I've got to be honest, it's quite weird, this. Well, that's, you know, that's a little bit of me coming out. There we go. So here comes your next spoon. Open wide, a little bit wider, a little bit wider. And there we go. Oh, now again. I'm not clear up about this. <laughs> I'm a, Give it a chew. I'm Come a on. Feel the, feel the texture. I mean, it's we haven't like, had anyone spit anything out yet. I mean, there's some sort of chutney on the top. Yeah. I feel like sushi. Is it, um, sushi? What is that? <laughs> is it like a potato crusting? Right. There's something you, sweet you on can, the top. Can, come on, you can take the blindfold off now. What the hell was that? So that was a lamb scrumpet oh. with mint chutney. I knew I wasn't happy about that. <laughs> what is it you hate about lamb? I'll tell you exactly what it is. When I was a kid... <laughs> I'd give you some water, but you don't like water either. I'll take anything at this stage. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, haven't got, we haven't got any water. Um, Johnny, Johnny, sorry, get, get some water. Get some water. Um, I um, we do uh, we do normally have water out for our guests, but that's uh, quite right. Johnny's Johnny's been. How do I not recognise that instantly as lamb? <laughs> I was like, what? I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Um, Johnny to the rescue. There we go. Oh, get rid of that. I. I can tell you exactly my issue with lamb. When I was a kid, I used to go on bike rides all the time, bike across the fields. There was a little wood. Mm. In the wood, there was someone sleeping rough for mm. a long time. And so as a kid, you can imagine, it was like, oh, quick, pedal past. Because I don't know what the right way to say this story is. is it homeless person, is that the right piece of yeah, turn? Yeah, yeah. Basically. Right, so in the wood, there was someone sleeping rough. So we used to bike past the wood quick because we didn't know who was in there and what was going on and as kids it's exciting isn't it oh drama excitement at some point whoever was sleeping in the woods must have eaten a lamb and and because the smell of mutton lamb tainted that bit of the bike ride for ages it was like rotting old lamb and the smell was so lingering and awful but i mean oh. I take your point. It's a, it's, a, it's a childhood scarring we're talking about here. But was that that terrible to eat? No, it wasn't. It's just that... Because Jamie's a very good chef. And I feel really rude now. <laughs> um, it's just whenever I hear lamb, I'm always like, oh, lamb, because it takes me back to that time. It does take you back. There, there's, an, uh, there's another animal that you said you wouldn't eat again, which was a guinea pig. Oh. Tell me about the guinea pig. Because it's not something that often gets served up. So I went to Peru um, in 2011, maybe. I went to Peru and did a lot of filming with some wonderful charities who were educating children who worked on rubbish dumps, who basically went out every day, scavenging for bits, take them back, clean them, sell doing. them. And so the charity were trying to get them into schools and they were showing us their wonderful work. And as part of showing us what happened, they took us out for lunch. So we went to this you know, place in the middle of nowhere. Um, it went out and there was a big garden and there was all these hutches and they were showing me around. And they showed me all these hutches and I was like, oh, that's cute. There's like guinea pigs, oh, that one's cute. Obviously there was a bit of a language and a cultural barrier, but I was enthusiastic because they were proud and I was being respectful. I thought they were just showing me their guinea pigs. I didn't realize that I was picking my lunch. <coughs> so the one that I thought was cute 
was then spatchcocked and deep fried. <laughs> but as I always say, what doesn't taste better deep fried? And, the, and it was, oh my, and, I felt, and you know that when, obviously I've, I've been very lucky that I've filmed in loads of random places that are mm. so culturally different. That's, I can't say that's wrong, that's their world. Mm. And they were so proud because it was a delicacy and they presented it to me. And this little, and it's, it still had claws with coleslaw. And I was like... Cole's, coleslaw and cor claws. Yeah, and oh, it's you, a good, good name for a restaurant, that, isn't it? <laughs> coleslaw know, and cor claws. I don't know what to say other than thank you. And, then and I, did you eat it? I had to, didn't I? Because it was like they they were, to them that was like, yeah. you know, it was a delicacy. They were really proud. That was like, they'd gone all out. And I was just like, and then we had this person with us who was um, sort of like a fixer and translating. And he's just looking at me and he's like, this is really important to them. And I was like, okay. And oh, <laughs> it's one of those things. I'm an animal lover. And it's one of those things that I will take with me to my grave. The day you ate guinea pig. Yeah. Well, each week... My nephew's got a guinea pig. I can't look at it. When I cuddle it, I have to like not look it in the eye. Because you instantly think of a deep fat fry. Yeah. And that... Claws. Claws and c coleslaw. It's quite hard to say that. Coles and... <laughs> Coles and clonk. I can't say it. Even, yeah, I mean, even spatchcock for me takes me to a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> now, each week, our previous guest... Okay. ...has a question for our next guest. Okay. So last week... It was the lovely man who is Ben Miller. And, oh. and Ben Miller has a question for you. And here it is. You are the proud owner, I presume, of a Blue Peter badge. Where would you prefer your Blue Peter badge took you, gave you special access to? Would it be option A, backstage at Taylor Swift's latest concert. 100% Option yes. Option B, <laughs> a training session with the SAS. Option C, would you like to sun yourself on the beaches of Guadeloupe? And the reason I'm asking that is because that's where we filmed Death in Paradise. Anyway, over to you, Helen. Um, I cannot act or sing. Yeah, I always watch Death in Paradise and think, I'd love to be that and the one in South Africa. I was thinking, I'd love to go there. So the beaches that are tempting. The SAS, I had a good time, but I've done that. So I would have to say a Taylor Swift concert because I love Taylor Swift. There you have it, Ben. The Blue Peter badge gets her into Taylor Swift. Oh, Swifty. So I've actually got my Blue Peter badge on. Oh, hello. Can we go to Taylor Swift together? Yes. This is actually Johnny's. I was going to say, that's a vintage. Well, no, mine's even older. So <gasps> mine's the original white one with just the ship, the blue ship on it. And I got it. I won, a, I won an art competition. I drew a picture of the six million dollar man when I was about six. And that's the extraordinary thing about Blue Peter, is it, you know, if you grew up in this country, mm -hmm. you grew up with Blue Peter. And you grew up on Blue Peter. Yeah. And I, I bang on about Blue Peter because it was the, like you say, it was my, it was the making of me. Mm. But there's a there's a poem online that I encourage everybody to go and look at. It's Tony Welsh talking about Blue Peter on the 60th anniversary. And he says it so much more eloquently than I can. In that he's, Blue Peter was talking about sustainability before sustainability was on the agenda. Mm. Blue Peter was telling kids to be whoever they want to be before we even knew what transgender meant. You know, Blue Peter was telling kids to take on the world and all the rest of it. And, and I just feel really proud to be linked to something that has that as its core value. Well, Blue Peter, what it always encouraged you to do was have a childhood. Yeah. And as an adult, have a childhood. Yeah. I mean, in my head, I've never really got past about 23 anyway. 27. Really? Is yeah. that as old as you've got? Yeah. Well, you've certainly crammed it in, Helen, and I don't know what you've got planned next, but we will all be waiting with bated <laughs> breath and you will probably be standing on the edge of a precipice about to throw yourself off something with bated <laughs> breath but thank you so much for being on Spooning with Mark today. Unfortunately that's all from Helen Skelton today but her new book In My Stride is out to buy now. Now, if you've enjoyed watching or listening to Spooning with Mark Wogan, you can find us across all social media and if you look at us on YouTube, you can find out who next week's celebrity guest is going to be. Next week, 
It is singer Alfie Bow. So until then, have a lovely week. <laughs>